Good morning. Good morning. Wow, this is uh, uh, going to be quite a closing, I think, for this year's annual conference. Uh, uh, interesting just to pull up in the buses, everyone talking about, you know, what we, what we uh, went to yesterday, what sessions, uh, some people talking about what they did last night, uh, and then to come uh, and pull up in front of here and uh, uh, just to, to feel the power of, of seeing this hotel that I think a lot of us have seen in pictures, but I know for me I've never seen in person. You know, there are a lot of iconic places in America, uh, you know, like Mount Rushmore, uh, the Grand Canyon, the Washington Monument, and you know, some of those are uh, creations of God, some of them are memorials to other people who have done amazing things. But then there are some places uh, that are a little bit different, uh, like Bunker Hill or Gettysburg or this spot we are in now where someone gave their life uh, for the ideas of this country. It's pretty powerful. Um, you know, some of you might know I, I like to read history as one of my hobbies and really get to uh, try to get an insight of the people that came before us and the challenges they faced and how they overcame them and the conflict that was part of every one of those stories, the conflict of people you know, fighting for what they believed in. Uh, and for me, I, I enjoy learning about those people's lives and I try to use it as a little bit of a inspiration or motivation for me um, to keep working to achieve more. So we started um, a couple mornings ago talking about Nats' new campaign around one million lives. Um, and I guess in, in sense, that's, a, that's an example of what I think a lot of us feel, hopefully all of us feel that are here today about why we're doing this work um, to change the lives of children. And in some ways, um, you know, that's what a lot of the folks came before us did uh, through the centuries of history of this country. Uh, to change the lives of the people who came after them, to make their lives better. And some people never lived to see that day. And this is one of those places that uh, memorializes just an incredible American uh, who in his 30s, that's very humbling for me, <laughs> in his 30s um, uh, achieved uh, all the things he did. So uh, we're going to hear right now from Reverend Samuel Billy Kyles, who was part of that, uh, of that work. Um, in Memphis, uh, he was leading, he was, he was fighting for uh, others. Uh, he was fighting uh, to uh, make parks accessible. He was fighting to desegregate the buses of Memphis. He was organizing uh, sanitary workers of Memphis. And the reason why Martin Luther King was here that day was to support those workers and your work uh, led him here. Uh, so that this is all part of the history of this amazing uh, country we live in in this season of elections and, and conflict is uh, frustrating as it sometimes can be is actually part of what makes us a great country. And it's always the work of individuals who make that happen. Um, we tend to think of it, these are forces of nature that makes history happen. That's actually not true. History is made by people. Um, people who decide to try to make things better. It's the kind of work you're doing as part of that history. Uh, in, the, in the work that Reverend Kyles has been doing his entire life uh, was part of that history. So it's a real pleasure for me to introduce, really humbling to introduce someone um, like Reverend Kyles uh, and have you share a few words with us about your life's accomplishments, um, what you've seen and what we can all learn from that. Reverend Kyles. Thank you so much. Thank you so much. Let me express to you how delighted I am to be 
among all these wonderful teachers and wannabe teachers. And I, uh, I want to thank you for coming to Memphis and for letting the Civil Rights Museum be a part of your, your activities. Now, I sound like I'm a horse, but it's so cold out there, not in here. <laughs> I was seated out there on a stool. And when people come by and they see the film and then they say, one lady touched me on the shoulder and I turned and she said, oh my God, I'm sorry. I thought you were one of those wax figures. <laughs> Anybody that marched with Martin Luther King has got to be 100 years old. <laughs> it's, it's, it's working. My youngest daughter is teaching at a charter school in Washington, D.C. And she loves it. She is, she's, she's bound by it. And today happens to be her birthday. She was one of the Memphis 13. There were 13 black children who integrated the schools in Memphis, and she was one of them. And I said, oh, this is is coming together. They are coming together rather rapidly because they told me I had 10 minutes. <laughs> <laughs> now you're gonna give a black preacher 10 minutes <laughs> with a microphone in front of him. I might sing me a tune before, before I leave. <laughs> Teachers are so special. They're just so special. The minds of our children are being brought together. 13 young children, I, I, I can remember what happened. I can remember the police. I said, I don't want the police coming to the house. There were 13 little black children going to school for the first day going to public school for the first day. I said, I don't want dogs and guns and all that. <coughs> Excuse me, we wanted, we wanted to, to, to make sure that we didn't get into a Little Rock situation. Little Rock's opened with, uh, with uh, people who were pretty much what they were going to be already. S seniors and juniors, they were already what they were going to be. Five-year-olds just play with five-year-olds. They do five-year-old stuff. And so we missed, thankfully. We didn't have to bring out any guns or dogs or anything of that sort. And here I am speaking to a group that's my oldest daughter. I don't know how old she is, but. <laughs> and then here I am with all these wonderful people on her 50th birthday. It's been a long time. I'm just really getting wind up now, y'all, but. <laughs> Who knows, the mind of a child, the mind of these children you're dealing with the minds of the children. It makes you so special. It makes you so special. Martin Luther King was very concerned about what was happening with the children. And so we, we are just pleased we're beyond pleased, we're happy and pleased that you're able to share these few minutes with us. 
I had the privilege of spending the last hour of Martin Luther King's life on earth. I came here to the museum to pick him up, going to take him to my home for dinner. And I said, why, why was I there? Why, with all that was going on, we almost missed the mountaintop speech because it was thunder and lightning and raining, and he thought there wouldn't be many people at the church. So he sent several of us to the church, and we came to the church. It was nearly full. I said, oh my goodness. So Abernathy, his assistant, sent for him, said, come over here. This is your crowd, Martin. I can't do anything with this. So they came here and picked him up and brought him back to the temple of, of love. I said, now, wait a minute. Something's, well, anyway. It's not that it need to be long. It just takes a long time to make it short. <laughs> <laughs> so when I came over here to get him, the next day, I came to get him. And we spent that last hour. The press wanted to know, well, what did you do? What did you talk about the last hour? I said, we talked preacher talk. I said, what's preacher talk? I said, whatever preachers talk about is preacher talk. <laughs> And we, and, and we on, went on like that. Then we had uh, Jesse Jackson was in the yard. Abernathy was in the yard, no, up, still upstairs. He was in the room, Abernathy was. I said, okay, how are we gonna handle this? He said, Jesse, you're not dressed for dinner. Jesse said, I don't need a shirt and tie, I got an appetite, that's all I need. He said, I want you to meet my band leader. So Martin was leaning over the railing to meet the band leader. I turned to go as easily as I could. I turned to go down the stairs. The shot rang out. Kapaya! I looked and he had been knocked from the railing back onto the floor. It was incredible. I was doing what needed to be done, but I didn't have any consciousness of it. And so, what do we do? I ran in the room to get the phone to call the, the ambulance. The operator left the phone, the switchboard, she just left it, and you had to use the switchboard to use a call, to get a call. And here they were, running, police, running, trying to get to Martin Luther King, lying on a cold concrete floor in Memphis, Tennessee. Why did he come to Memphis? To help sanitation workers. That's why he came. With all of his skills, all the things he could have been, all the things he could have made of himself and of others. Why did he come? Here he is. All of this education, all of the things that he, he's able to do and able, he has been able to do. All of that comes together. And we held fast. The operator came and saw him lying on the floor. She had a heart attack. And she died a few days later. All of this is going on. Hold fast to your dreams. Langston Hughes says, for if dreams die, you are like broken-winged birds that, that cannot fly. 
So hold fast to your dreams. Why was I there? Of all the places I could have been, all the places he could have been, we were going to my home, but we never got there. Never got there. Hold fast to your dreams. For if dreams die, you are like broken winged birds that cannot fly. Hold fast to your dreams of more acceptance of charter schools. There's a picture of us pointing. I hollered to the policemen as they were coming, call an ambulance on your police radio, Dr. King has been shot. And they said, where did the shot come from? So we are pointing, I'm pointing, Andy Young is pointing, and someone else, we are pointing. I'm doing what needed to be done, but I was doing it perfunctionarily. Just doing it. So the police came, and the, and the ambulance came, and they took him to the hospital. I told them what hospital to take him to, and they did. Hold fast to your dreams. For if dreams die, you are like broken winged birds that cannot fly. There was so much blood gushing from the wound in his face. We held fast. They said, we will shoot this dreamer and see what happens to his dream. I am the witness. You will see some of the witness this morning in film. Hold fast to your dreams, for if dreams die, you are like a broken winged bird that cannot fly. Why was I there? That's where I was supposed to be. Crucifixions have to have witnesses. And so he had witnesses. They said, we will shoot this dreamer and see what happens to his dream. That's where the other witness comes in. What happens to his dream? Sadly, I come to tell you, yes, you can kill the dreamer. But heavens knows you cannot kill the dream. The dream is still alive. Thank you very much.